Hello, I'm Len. I'm your uh, host of Target Justice v. Garland, a podcast about an extraordinary lawsuit. With me, as always, my co-host, a remarkable woman with incredible legal talents, Anna Toledo. Uh, Anna, please say hello to our viewers. Hello, everybody. And we apologize for the delay but as you know we are always being followed by the government criminals that don't want us to speak our truth and uh we're ready to do just that correct no matter what electronic interference we we've experienced it a hundred times and it's ongoing issue nevertheless we do we're doing our best today podcast is dedicated to legal updates in cases that are relevant to our case. Uh, speaking in general, Anna, I know that you've done some calculation and how many legal cases has been filed with the um, relations to targeting before our lawsuit? Well, I did a search. I did a Westlaw search with the terms organized stalking, gang stalking, direct dead energy weapons. And I came out with, it's over 200 over 300 I, I don't recall right now i have a i made a spreadsheet about it and uh the interesting part about it is the increment after 2004 which is when the tseb came into place and that most of these decisions are go unpublished which means they don't go into the official federal supplement or federal register that are the books that where the decisions of the united states courts are published i'm talking federal system i'm not talking state courts so um, I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to write about that uh, because I think it's very interesting for the targeted community to realize that the lawsuit that we have filed is different from every case that has been filed before, and the reason for that is that it is grounded on uncontroverted material facts, admissions by the FBI and the DOJ that number one, innocent people are placed on a terrorist list, people without reasonable criteria. Number two, that 97% of the terrorist screening database is comprised of non-investigative subjects. And those are uncontroverted facts admitted by the defendants that cannot be brushed under any, you know, swept under any rug. And that is the difference between all the cases before. I'm not saying they didn't have merit. I'm just saying that is a, that's why our case stands out from the rest. I completely agree. The legal strategy that you developed in Targeted Justice v. Garland is truly novel. You, you're you asking novel questions, the district court and then uh, right now Court of Appeals. But one thing stood out to me, the, the fact that these are unpublished decisions for, for all the previous cases, what's the significance of it? You can still find it in your special database but you cannot find it in federal register. What's the significance of it? Well, like I have said before, I think that uh, many courts cannot fathom that what people write is real because they don't want to think that their government is doing this to them. It is outrageous. And it shocks the conscience, which is something we're going to talk about a little in a little while. And so um, I just think that they, uh, some of these lawsuits, unfortunately, uh, are very discombobulated. And, and because the plaintiffs didn't know who was responsible for what's happening to them. So they, you know, they, some of them sued the people they heard in their V2K or, you know, they, they not necessarily follow a very coherent line. However, that doesn't mean that something isn't going on. I think that the courts have to look at, wait a minute, it's not just one or two crazy cases. These are hundreds now. So there must be something going on. And the courts have a duty to protect the Constitution. And that's where we come in. We're saying, you know, we are 
screaming that our constitutional rights, you know, the constitutional rights, not just of these 18 plaintiffs, because there's people that are going around with the narrative, oh no, it's just 18 plaintiffs. No, that the person that says that has not read the lawsuit, because as we have said over and over again, this lawsuit is about declaring illegal handling codes three and four of the Terry Screening database that contain the names of people that do not meet the minimal reasonable suspicion criteria to be deemed a suspected terrorist. And this has been admitted by the FBI. So if handling codes three and four are eliminated, targeted individuals will be set free. And so for those people, naysayers going around saying, this is only about 18 people. No, this is about 18 brave people like Dr. Lambert, who takes inordinate amount of abuse just to stand as cannon fodder for the rest of the targeted individuals. And that is what people need to understand. These are courageous targeted justice members and volunteers that have placed their, line of the li their life on the line. Like Melody, one of our plaintiffs, every day, the criminals force her in the street almost to have accidents, okay? And, and, and all of our plaintiffs go atrocious abuse. So these 18 people, they are heroes. And the targeted community should look up to them as such because they are fighting for all of you, including you, my dear friend. Thank you for your kind words. I think everybody, all 18 plaintiffs are completely dedicated to seeing it through. You are dedicated, targeted justice is de dedicated. We're not gonna stop fighting because our targeting might increase. Y yes, the, we, we've had tremendous escalation in targeting, almost incompatible with just the minimum expectations of quality of life. And yet we're here. So nothing will stop us. Let's go to the topic of today's podcast. For today's podcast, we picked uh, three case, legal cases that are still ongoing and very relevant to what we're doing. And we, we talked about these cases before, but today is a podcast to give you updates about these issues. The first one is uh, FBI v. Fickra. The issue is, uh, in this case is whether respondents claim challenging his payment on the no-fly list are moot, given that he was removed from the no-fly list in 2016, and the government provided a sworn declaration stating that it will not be placed on the no-fly list in the future based on the currently available information. I want to tell everybody that originally it was Ficker versus, uh, versus FBI. And now after he received a positive affirmation of his claims, FBI filed this case and went with it to Supreme Court. And if you remember, we talked about the oral arguments in the Supreme Court that took place on January 8th of 2024, and it was decided on March 19th of this year, 9 to 0. The unanimous decision was in the benefit of the def defendant, in, in this case, the figure. Before we go further, do you have any comments, um, Anna? Yeah, I, I, I like to remind people that uh, Fikra versus FBI is a case that is 10 years old. It took 10 years for this case to get to the Supreme Court. On two occasions, it has been on the Ninth Circuit. And the important for me, yeah, it's important that the Supreme Court said, no, the case is not moved, the case can continue, because when you read the decision of the Ninth Circuit, it's precious. The Ninth Circuit said, no, this man has a due process right to find out why he was placed on the list and if there was you know, sufficient criteria, because that was, that's his lawsuit, that he wasn't given notice and he wasn't given an opportunity process, opportunity to challenge it. So that, this is why this case is so absolutely crucial, because it's going to open the door 
for many other cases, challenging their placement on the watch list and on the TSDB, it, it, it just opened the doors for that. Thank you, Anna. So on this slide, you can see that the affirmation of the decision of the Ninth Circuit um, by the Supreme Court was twofold. First of all, it said, no, it's not moot. He can be put on the no-fly list anytime again using your criteria. So it, no, it is not moot. But the second part, which really impressed me as well as you, is that um, the, the Supreme Court said that the government had violated uh, Mr. Ficker's rights to procedural due process by failing to provide any meaningful notice of his addition to no fly list. My question is, is it a narrow decision? Does it apply only to the no fly status or can it be expanded to other categories on uh, TSDV, terror screening database? Well, that's certainly what we're going to argue. I, I think the, th the thing is that in, in our situation of my clients, the only way we they found out is because accidentally two deputy sheriffs revealed that they were on, on, on the terror screening database. And like we have said all along, the people on Handling Code 3 and 4, they, since they're not supposed to find out, they don't have a DHS trip redress procedure. So I believe that the due process rights for targeted individuals is even huger here because they weren't even given notice that they form part of this, of this database that has changed their lives in so many ways. Yeah, I definitely, the, 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 the due process requirement applies to everybody when their rights are being infringed upon. That's very significant. If the Supreme Court thinks that the due process applies to no-fly list, all the other categories, especially the categories of uh, the expanded selectee uh, list who have nothing to do with national security, if that applies to that, if the due process clause applies to no-fly list, surely it would apply to the people who are not national security, the threat to national security. I am absolutely with you. The, this argument can be made and should be made. And what's next? What, who? This is a, a Supreme Court decision. Do you think the FBI will react in some fashion to it? Do you think there will be some kind of um, appeal? What's next? What, what kind of action we what's should next? explain after this? Well, what's next is that it, they go back to the district court. District court has been reversed twice already. So, and, the, and the Ninth Circuit was very upset. The last time I said, the district court didn't obey us. We told them that they had to do this, and they did not obey us. So now they are going back with a mandate, not just from the Ninth Circuit, but from the Supreme Court. And so this, the, I, I think that the, the, the district court has to now look into the due process, Mr. Fikra's due process claims. And that's what the government was really scared of. They didn't want to admit it in the, in the oral argument. If you listen very carefully, they were scared of the plethora of complaints that will be filed against the government demanding their due process. But, but the, the Supreme Court tailored it to this particular case. Because the, the torture they did on Mr. Fikre was atrocious. They, they literally tortured him, and he was in the United Arab Emirates. I mean, what they did to this man was, was beyond not, you know, beyond de delaying his flight. It was atrocious. And I think that it, it shocked the court's conscience of, of you know, and, and that's why they allowed him. Because then all of a sudden they said, okay, you're no longer on the watch list. Excuse me? You tortured this man. You had him sort of jailed for this much time, da da da, and then you just come out and say, "No, no, he's no longer, you know, we no longer have him in the watch list." No, he has a right to know if, to begin with, he should have been on that watch list. Anna, do you do you have any plans to use this argument, use this Supreme Court affirmation in your future legal arguments? Of course, 
because it's due process. And that's what we have been alleging all along. But at the same rate, you know, um, it, it's different because because the atrocities committed against targeted individuals are even worse because they have not been even told, not even post facto, that they're on the list. And the FBI refuses to admit or deny that they are on the list. You know, because you know what? If they denied it under oath, case would be over. But they don't dare do it. Because they yeah. know they're on the list. If they do that or show us the list and we're not there, exactly. then close our case. Yeah. Yeah. Show show I, the list. I agree. Let's move on and go to the next case that we covered before. It's called Kovac v. Ray. And this is a more of a broad constitutional case. Basically, the question, the issue in this legal case is whether federal agencies' creation, maintenance, and operation of the federal terror watch list possess a major question that demands clear congressional authorization. And if so, whether such clear congressional authorization exists. So this case, it's before the Fifth Circuit right now. It, this has also gone to the Fifth Circuit twice. And this case is contingent on right now. There's two cases in the Supreme Court that have to do with the overruling of what's called a Chevron rule, which was granting uh, deference, huge deference to administrative agencies to do as they pleased. And, and there's two really important cases that I think that will substantially limit administrative agencies like the FBI ability to curtail people's rights. In this case, what, what's very important is that the district court in Kovac said, said this, yes, the lives of people are substantially affected when they are placed on the watch list. And the major questions rule says, if an act of the government substantially affects the life of somebody, it has to come from Congress. It has to be an act of Congress. And so I think that this case is, is very much contingent on the pending decision of, of the two cases challenging the Chevron rule in the Supreme Court. And I really hope, because the important part in this case has been solved, which is that the district court acknowledged and, res and adjudicated that being placed on the watch list substantially affects a person's life. But, you know, it... it in the oral argument, I think they had a missed opportunity uh, there because I think many judges and, and many people are just so scared of the terrorism narrative and, and that's just operating in the back of their minds and they don't realize that most of the terrorism is created by the FBI and the CIA and it's just false flag operations. So I... I, I I think they missed an opportunity to explain how it's not just about traveling, but how in it, it, other parts of their life are substantially affected in order to trigger the major questions rule. Let's talk about this uh, hearing, about the oral arguments that were held on March 11th of this year in Cork v. Ray, which is in the Fifth Circuit, the same circuit that the uh, our cases in. So there's a 24 minute recording of the oral arguments. Uh, it, it's available on the Fifth Circuit website. I will put uh, a link in the description. And to me, I used uh, some of the pleadings to kind of summarize what the plaintiff's attorney uh, was saying. District Court did not conclude that the text of any specific statute unauthorized federal agencies to create, maintain, and use the watch list. Instead, the argument was cobbled together from a hodgepodge of different statutes. And in the oral arguments, they went through this hodgepodge and say, well, the defendants say this applies, and let me explain why it doesn't apply. And there is another little piece of litigation, not a little bit of litigation, but there is not a congressional authorization to do all these things. So it is what it is. 
the oral arguments uh, happened and the Fifth Circuit decision is pending. So we're all waiting for that decision. Do you have any predictions, Anna? Right now, everybody's, you know, like on the edge of their seat because uh, it, it's, a, it's a very important case. And, and the court, you know, the, the court knows that Kovac is going to the Supreme Court if they don't prevail. So, so they, they will, I mean, they will, they're, uh, it's Mr. Abbas, you know, they're going to go to the Supreme Court. And if the Chevron rule is brought down, well, then he has a better argument because the district court already concluded that being placed on the watch list, which is as most people in, that are watching now, is being placed in handling coach one and two of the Terry screening database, while innocent people that have no ties to terrorism are placed in handling codes three and four. So the district court of, for the Northern District of Texas concluded that being placed on a watch list, which is one and two, has substantial impact on a person's life. And that's, you know, the bottom line argument. It has to come from an act of Congress. And you have to ask yourself, how come since 2004 and after so much litigation, Congress hasn't come down with a statute creating the terrorist data, screening database. And I think it's that FBI loves the ambiguity. Correct. The the ambiguity is definitely there. They, they make argument that every time, uh, every year, the Congress kind of approved what they're doing. But even if they approved what they're doing, they never authorized the things that they're doing. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation. Uh, let's go to our third case, which I think is remarkable. You will remember what this case is about. It's Corolla v. Garland, uh, and currently it's in District Court of Massachusetts. If you remember our story that uh, Mr. Corolla is a mayor of one of the cities in New Jersey, and he was not allowed to be at the White House, at, the, at a reception devoted to, I think, opening of Ramadan. So he was stopped, and so this is what's been challenged. This one is the one that was filed on September of 2023. And mm -hmm. then they filed, the government filed a motion to transfer or dismiss on on um, February 20, 2024, and then an amended complaint has been filed. You're absolutely right. On February 24th, government defendants filed a motion to transfer or to dismiss for failure to state claim. Well, in the motion to transfer, they said it should be in the District of Columbia where we control of all the judges and then we can uh, dismiss that case. Or you can dismiss it yourself for failure to stay, to stay the claim. What's, what I found interesting is that in this filing, they used uh, a document called Watch Listing Overview as of September 2020. It's, it's an exhibit A in it. And when I read it, it pre, it's pretty much congruent with what we know from the presidential executive order. It contains known and suspected terrorists. And that's it as, as of September 20. I know that in our case, the government defendants filed a declaration of acting director of uh, terrorist screening uh, Center, Mr. Robinson, and that contradicts this Exhibit A. Uh, Mr. Robinson uh, said that it's not known and it's not only known and suspected terrorists in TSC. It's also people selected using additional secret criteria. That's the first thing that I noticed. What was your impression, Anna? Well, also. This case now there's another there's a there's a director a new director Michael Glashine. You have to ask yourself why why didn't they submit something signed under penalty of perjury by the new director? This whole secrecy thing is unconstitutional because you have an you have to have an opportunity not only of notice but also to know under what criteria they're putting you there and the interesting part of this is that this motion was filed on the twentieth of 
February. However, a month later, on the 19th of March, FICRE was decided. And FICRE opposes, you know, concludes opposite of what they say. They say, because plaintiffs receive constitutionally adequate process, which is post facto, you know, after supposedly the DHS trip, um, the procedural due process claims should be dismissed. That's not what FBI v. FICRE says. So this, they tried to act before the Supreme Court adjudicated FICRE. And, and that, that argument under FICRE now becomes moot because the Supreme Court decided the opposite, that FICRE has a due process right to challenge his nomination and inclusion in the watch list. So I don't know what, you know, what, where, where that goes, because I didn't see that. I only saw that they filed an amended complaint. I didn't see a reply per se to their request to transfer or dismiss. No, it, it, I haven't been able to find it in the uh, PACER database either. But as I was uh, kept reading this motion to transfer, it became clear to me that the exhibit A was talking about watch listing. But what TSC does, it goes above watch listing. This is what I found in this motion. I think that the government defendants in Karula v. Garland declare that the expanded selectee list was created outside of what presidential executive order of 2003 allowed. The TSDS, the terror screening data set, that we know that it's a terror screening database, contains subsets of data known as no-fly list, the selectee list, and the expanded selectee list. If you remember, watch list, only contain the uh, no flight and the selectee list. But the entire database includes no fly, selectee, and the expanded selectee. They didn't talk about expanded selectee list in the watch list. So all this time when you were teaching me about, no, no, Len, remember, understand that watch listing and the TSDB are not the same thing. And now I finally get it because the government told me in their writing. So inclusion on any of these lists requires satisfaction of additional criteria distinct and over and above that required for designation as known or suspected terrorist and inclusion in the TSDS generally. What in this sentence, the government openly says that, yes, we created TSD, TSDB per presidential order of 2003, and we also went above and beyond just on our own, we just decided to expand it. And nobody stopped us, and we just continued breaking the law. And you're Isn't reading that... it right, because no. they feel they are about the law because they have gotten away with it for so long. And now we have Congress authorizing that even the, the air conditioning repairman do a little report on you and spy on you when he comes to your house. That is what Speaker Johnson uh, proposed and everybody there, uh, not everybody, but most the majority of the House voted for. So they have been getting away with this illegality for a long time. I'm sure we can't avoid talking about FISA. It passed the Congress, the House of Representatives, literally in a tie. And now it's the Senate job to look at this uh, continuing FISA practice. And there are a lot of senators that might uh, might be on our side that FISA is just really warrantless spying on Americans. But I have a low expectation for the Senate because there are a lot of people um, in bed with the intelligence agencies. That's my personal, personal view. Well, uh, I agree with you. The evidence is that yesterday they threw to the trash can the impeachment articles that were passed in the House against Mr. Mayorkas, and they just completely disregarded them. So that, that just goes to show you 
I mean, I, they're not serving the American people. They really aren't. And that's that's very sad. We need change, and we are working toward this change. So that concludes our legal update of cases relevant to target justice v. Garland. I wanted to mention, though, I wanted to mention uh, two things, if you allow me, in the Carula case, the amended complaint. Uh, One of the things, first of all, I want to read you a quote from the defendants uh, that they they talk about what they want, what they have been denying targeted individuals. They say they cite a case says substantive due process protects the narrow set of fundamental interests so deeply rooted and sacrosanct that no amount of process would justify their deprivation. What about the presumption of innocent innocence that targeted individuals have that the FBI admits have no ties to terrorism, are no threat to national security, and yet you place them in this list and throw the vigilantes from the Department of Homeland Security at them following everywhere they go. Isn't that a violation of the most sacrosanct right of freedom? And then I also wanted to mention that what they added in the new complaint follows this discussion we just had. They added as the last two claims, the non-delegation and the improper delegation of authority which uh, follows, you know, if the Chevron rule is brought down and, and it is that they have to, they have, it's the major questions, doctrines, the non-delegation, re-delegation and sub-delegation of a, a congressional authority, the separation of powers. If Congress did not authorize this, it should not, it should not be held. It's legal. So those are, you know, I, I was looking what was different aside from the fact that they added two plaintiffs also. They added two more plaintiffs to the lawsuit. One thing that does shock me and, and bothers me is that um, I don't think there's a single woman as a plaintiff. They're all men. And I think this follows the, you know, the, the Muslim tradition that women are not, don't have the same rights as men, I, I don't see why they can't put in there a woman. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's that's how it is. Anyway, so that, that's that's. I just wanted to, because I stayed till really late last night reading, comparing both lawsuits, and and I just uh, wanted to uh, let you know about that. Thank you, Len. Thank you, Anna, for this analysis. What you said before that the national security is sacrosanct and constitutional rights are somehow less, that's not the decision to make. Substantive due process presents the govern- prevents the government from engaging in conduct that shocks the conscience, and that's a quote, shocks the conscience or interferes with rights implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. They just described what they do to targeted individuals. Well, thank you, Anna. We don't have anything else for the legal update on this relevant cases. This uh, is probably a, a slightly shorter podcast, and and it's easier for us to make shorter podcasts when we can. So be ready for this. I have a short announcement that uh, my Substack access has been uh, tampered with. And currently, I cannot post anything on my Substack. I have over 6,000 subscribers. And if uh, during this week nothing happens, I will have to start a parallel, a new Substack. And I hope that you will move your memberships to that new Substack. It, the name of my Substack is Homo Interruptus with uh, uh, Len Bear MD. And so I'll. Uh, call it Homo Interruptus 2 with Len Bear MD because I simply cannot access the app. And it's all done on purpose. It's all done in conjunction with our latest symposium, which we had uh, a week, over a week ago, called Target Doctors, and my lecture in which I described diagnostic criteria for NKBI 
and why this current, most current uh, JAMA article about fMRI in patients with AHI was completely cooked. It was the data was cooked, and I explain why, and uh, I'm not the only one uh, criticizing Dr. Relman, Robert McCrate, they all came out, uh, Mark Zaid, they all came out with criticism because they're not using the scientific method. So that's all for me. Anna, today you have final words and uh, to say goodbye to our viewers and uh, making any announcements uh, that you might have. Please. Yeah, well, I, I want to uh, emphasize to people to continue subscribing and liking our content in a real targeted justice channel in Rumble. It's important to us because it's a great way to spread the word about, you know, the, the reality of targeting. And, and to everybody out there, I just want to assure you, we are fighting tooth and nail and we're never giving up uh, this fight. It might sometimes seem we, we do have setbacks, but if it was easy, it wouldn't be worth it. So um, I, I just urge you all to continue and, and most importantly, pray and pray that, um, you know, to, to protect and shield those judges that have to make the very difficult decisions in our case, because, you know, they are probably being attacked with the same weaponry that we are being attacked to a different, you know, a different degree. So pray for them as well, because we really, this this is really a spiritual war right now. And and we really need uh, the prayer warriors to come in to, to help us with this legal battle. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And until next time, everybody.